Uh, and Troy, thanks for letting me take this introduction. Uh, I have a, a pretty deep connection with our, uh, our next speaker who's going to close us out today. So I met a young man named Clint Hynote in a Russian language classroom uh, at the U.S. Air Force Academy in 1988. And his fellow freshmen and fellow Southerners, him from Mississippi and me from Alabama, I will never forget sitting in this classroom, uh, Major Gadaspro walks in the room and not a single word of English is spoken for about an hour and a half. And Clint and I were just staring at each other going, oh my goodness, what did we get ourselves into? So <laughs> uh, I, I've known Clint for a long time. Uh, after we graduated, uh, we got to serve together flying F-16s for quite a while. Uh, then Clint went to the F-117, which I don't know if it existed at the time, at least overtly, uh, but he got to fly that uh, pretty sweet airplane. And then we shared several other experiences together, uh, both at the US uh, Air Force Weapons School, then multiple Pentagon tours. And then his military career really took a turn upwards where his mind kind of petered out. So Lieutenant General uh, Clint Hynote, uh, recently retired, he was promoted to the rank of retired uh, from the US Air Force. He served as the Deputy Chief of Staff uh, for strategy, integration, and requirements at Headquarters Air Force, which is in the Pentagon, where he was the single Air Force leader responsible for representing the voice of tomorrow's airmen and developing Air Force strategy and concepts. So he was also manifesting an integrated future force design and building the operational capabilities required so that today's airmen and tomorrow's airmen could fight and win. So I already told you he was commissioned from the Air Force Academy in 1992, uh, got tons of degrees, and I can't read them all, uh, but he culminated with a PhD from uh, Air University in military strategy. So Clint, it's really my honor, and I thank you for taking the time uh, to give us our, our going away address today. Clint Hynote. Thanks very much. <clears throat> so I don't even know if Mark knows this, but I've had to resurrect a little bit of my Russian. Uh, both of us had, uh, had the instructors uh, laughing because you know we had that southern accent and uh, trying to speak in the in Russian in a southern accent can be pretty funny it's like those padanya you know and uh, so um, we have a Ukrainian family living with us right now and uh, and they speak Russian they speak Ukrainian and um, it's not like I can speak a lot with them but I can understand a little bit about what they're saying and that was actually really good okay uh, I have a request for you Get your phones out, if you don't already have them, because I know some of you already have them. You've been checking out and about it. OK, like look at the email, go to LinkedIn, send me a connect request, whatever. I mean, do what you would normally do anyway. Because my job today is to be more interesting than that phone. And I think I'm going to do it. But you know what? If, you, if, if it's not happening, go check your email. Go, go text. It's totally OK. Doesn't bother me at all. Um, but I'm going to start. Well, I, I, while, while you're checking your email, I'm going to say uh, thank you to Skydio. Thank you to GovExec. Uh, thank you for all the folks who put this together. Uh, thanks to all of you for showing up. And I'm excited about being with you today. OK, now it's time for me to be interesting. Drones are not transformational. It's very interesting, you know, a lot of, I, I'm getting a lot of very interesting eyes looking back at me. Like, what? Yeah, of course they are. Well, so, of course, I don't want to get into the whole world, uh, the whole word of transformational, what it means, and I could sit up here and define it for three hours if we wanted, but we don't. What we want to do is just talk a little bit about what's changing and what might not be changing. I, I do think drones are changing things. If nothing else, just the ability to do, and I see that we're small unmanned aerial systems or uncrewed aerial systems, just taking the person out of the equation does change things, right? It, it changes the risk that you would be willing to take with a certain platform because at some point, uh, you probably sent a combination of a person and a platform to do a job, and now you can send a robot, a small UAS, a underwater uh, uncrewed vehicle, a, uh, a sail drone, whatever it is. And now you can do something different with it. And your risk level is, is a lot different. In fact, for Westerners, th there's a huge difference 
in, uh, in, the, in between using a drone to do something and using a person and a platform to do something. You ever thought about that? We just had a predator get shot down over uh, Yemen, or it was over the Red Sea, but it was, do, do y'all know, I mean, does that, does that register? I mean, because I don't think it re really registers, right? I mean, does, it, does anybody really care if we lose an uncrewed thing? I, I mean, I will be honest with you, I'd rather not lose it, if it, but honestly, I don't necessarily care that much. And I don't think very many of us did, because I think we've had three shot down over the Red Sea. And honestly, I'm not sure that, uh, that I'm, I couldn't tell you the details of those. And, and uh, you know, we had a, uh, well, it's not, the, it's the Navy's version of the Global Hawk, but we had a, a ran shot down a daggum Global Hawk over the, uh, over the uh, Persian Gulf. I don't remember there being a lot of outrage. Maybe I'm wrong. But what I'm saying is what the difference between an uncrewed thing being killed, attrited, and a crude thing being killed or attrited is massive in our culture. Massive. Have you ever thought about that? If, if Iran shoots down a U-2 over the Red Sea or over the Persian Gulf, what do you think we're doing? We're probably like, like launching multiple strikes and all this stuff into Iran. I don't remember doing that. It's a massive difference. So a lot of that has to do with how we, we being Western militaries, Western people, think about the value of life and the value of individual life. Not everybody thinks that way. As an example right now, um, it's pretty clear that the Russian military doesn't think that way because they are clearly using human wave tactics against Ukraine to do things that they couldn't do otherwise. And that's an important thing to know. We would never be able to use human wave tactics and keep our jobs as generals. You just can't do it. We'd be fired immediately. And that's a good thing. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's a good thing. Um, it's pretty unimaginative some of the things that the Russians are doing right now. But you know what? They're, they're fighting for what they were going to fight for. And the Ukrainians are fighting for their country. So. So I think that it would be wrong to say that drones don't change things, because they do. But there's not a whole lot that we're doing with drones that we couldn't do with combinations of people and platforms. Maybe there's nothing. I'd have to really think through that. And maybe there's one or two things. But generally, I mean, if you're going to go uh, diffuse an, uh, uh, an integrated explosive device, we could do that with a person. If you're going to go, you know, uh, take a, a camera up in the air, we could do that with a helicopter and a person. You know, and I could go on. So I'm going to say drones probably aren't that transformational. So we're, we're done, right? Uh, yeah, go build your drones, have fun with them, you know, take your cool pictures of yourself while you're riding down, you know, the street and all that. Uh, I, I don't believe that they're not transformational when you combine them with other things. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that, with that, uh, about that with you. And the big idea that I want to get across to you today is not going to be drones are all this or, or drones are transformational. It's that the way that you can use the technologies that are coming forward today has the potential to change the way we do military operations, law enforcement, border security, emergency management, um, disaster relief, uh, and, and I, fire, firefighting, and I could go on. And I think what I'm going to talk about while, uh, while we look at it from the, from the perspective of military engagement, I think it's very applicable to all of those things I just mentioned and more. And it's important that we get that part right because I'm talking to a bunch of people who are either building these things or buying these things or figuring out how these things are going to get used or going back to their bosses and saying, wow, you know, this is really important that we get into this or that we do this or start this program of record. And uh, you ought to have an idea of why you're doing that. And it probably is just not drones are cool. 
So I don't believe that drones are transformational in and of themselves. I absolutely believe that when you combine uncrewed things, uncrewed platforms with integrated military and, uh, and um, open source sensing, most of that, the majority of that's open source. And then you combine that with very good communications and the ability to use those communications for command and control. Then you have something that is transformational. And it's changing the way people are fighting today. It will change the way people are fighting tomorrow. It will change the way that we think about firefighting and emergency management and disaster relief. And if we don't get in front of it, we won't realize the full potential of it. And I think I'm talking to a group of folks who want to get out in front of it. And so this is why I'm going to talk about uh, the transformation of the Trinity. We, uh, uh, my friend Mick Ryan, who is an Australian general officer, uh, and I just published a, a paper about uncrewed systems from the Special Competitive Studies Project. If you want to look at a summary that's shorter and gets most of the information out, that was in War on the Rocks a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Mick is one of these incredible individuals. He's written several books. Uh, White Sun War is the latest one. It's basically a better version of Ghost Fleet. Uh, I won't, don't tell Peter I said that. Um, uh, but it, it's very interesting. And Mick has been to Ukraine, I want to say like five times. He's been to Israel already. He just has this ability to see things and, and to and to think through them. And I, I felt like in many ways I was learning from him and just trying to translate some of his big ideas. But the big idea that he had was when you combined military uh, civil fusion networks with command and control that works, that would be across domains, and we could talk all about JADC2 and everything like that. And I was one of the first people to be talking about that. And I'm a pretty big believer, but you know what? We don't have to get there today. Just think about capable command and control. And you put on that the, the, the ability of doing so many of these things with uncrewed platforms, and a lot of them. And now you have something called the transformative trinity. He believes that is changing the battle space in Ukraine, and to the detriment of the Ukrainians, he believes Russia is learning the lessons faster than the Ukrainians. So damn, right? I, I don't like that. I'd like to see my family be able to go back home. So what's really going on? Well, it's clear that the Ukrainians are gathering information from everywhere they can get it. And that includes things like air traffic control, um, it includes uh, the uh, social media. I don't know why. I think it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. But Russian soldiers can't stop posting things on social media. I mean, literally. I, I mean, it, it, it's life and death for them. And they still can't stop it. And you would be amazed at the amount of battle damage assessment that is being accomplished right now because of social media imaging. So, uh, by the way, I mean, think about the problem of taking, you know, the phones away from your soldiers. Uh, like you're getting ready to go into combat. Are you going to be able to take all your, your soldiers' phones? What do you think? They've probably got burner phones, right? I mean, that's what's going to happen. Uh, they, that's, uh, they're they're going to end up with like four and, and something on their, you know, their watch because they can't not have it, right? And so um, I'm scared of this. And oh, by the way, when you, do, when you use the cell phone, the cellular data, that sig signals intelligence. And you better believe that that is available to folks to target you. OK, so there's a lot of sensor fusion that's going on, including a lot of open source data. What we also see is the ability to get that data to different parts of the battle space is really better. It's a lot better than it has been. And it used to be that we made a lot of decisions to get data back to the headquarters, right? I mean, for all of us who have served in a headquarters, that it was often true that the best information was in the operations center, the air operations center, the maritime operations center, the, uh, the brigade talk, whatever you're talking about. And now 
it doesn't have to be that way because communications are, in many ways, secure. They're, it's pretty easy to get information to the front if you choose to do so. And so you, you may have the case when people on the front lines of a conflict, and it's easy to think about this in the ground sense because the front line is literally a line, uh, but you can think about this in all domains. It just feels a little different. But the, the people on the front lines may have better awareness than the people back in the headquarters. And that has not always been true. So if a frontline leader knows what is going on from the data feeds and can see things and hear things, because they can. I mean, we're talking, they're, they're less than a few kilometers apart right now. Then actually, it's very possible that the frontline leader knows best. And that's an interesting point, right? And, uh, and so this gets into what we believe is the true transformative nature of the Trinity. So drones and C2 and civil military fuse networks, sensing. And that is, and here's the big idea, so you can go to sleep after this or check your cell phones and all this stuff. Every leader at the engagement level could have access to the effects of the Trinity. Now, now it's not true everywhere because people aren't choosing to do it. It's not true with our, as an example, let's, let's start uh, broadening the picture out a little bit. Okay, uh, our on-scene commanders. I, I suspect there's some on-scene commander uh, folks who are in here, okay. Um, you probably don't have access to your own drone air force right now. Probably. You know, uh, who, who uh, okay, so the, uh, the commander in charge uh, in a law enforcement engagement. Um, who likes watching chase scenes on the LA highways? I do. I really do. It's a lot of fun, right? I'm old enough to remember O.J. Simpson. Uh, and uh, we all watch Mesmerized by, you know, oh my gosh, this guy is trying to, uh, to evade the police. So um, when we watch the chase scenes, we're watching through a news camera uh, and a news helicopter. But you can better believe there is a helicopter, a police helicopter, doing the same thing. And probably they're trying to not hit each other. And, uh, and stuff. Now, who believes that that helicopter reports, the police helicopter reports to the on scene commander on the ground? I don't. And uh, now maybe I'm totally wrong. And if I am, I want you to stand up right now and say, there's, oh no, I mean, we, we right now have a helicopter assigned to every precinct and all this. And I bet you the answer is you don't. I bet you it's centrally controlled. I bet you that somebody at headquarters, whatever headquarters looks like, tells the, the police uh, helicopter to go somewhere, and that person, that, that entity, can tell them to go somewhere else for a higher priority. Probably, at least plausible. Same with firefighting, same with border patrol, same with uh, anything that we're doing in, the, in terms of emergency management. It's almost certain that we're using centralized control to be able to figure out who is supported. So for my Army friends, um, enablers. Who has control of the enablers? At least the brigade level, right? Probably the, and, and could be, depending on what the enablers are, the, the division level, right? It's not the platoon level, and it's not the company level. Does, any, does anybody in any companies have uh, access to um, any of the uh, type, uh, type 2 UAS right now? Nope. OK, I didn't think so. But, but let's think about that. Why not? So uh, I'm looking at one of Scadio's uh, uh, quadcopters over there. Um, 
it strikes me that if we're talking about assets like that, there is no reason, none whatsoever, that a on-scene commander or a platoon leader or a company commander or a, uh, a, a officer in charge of the scene can't have that reporting to him or her. I don't see a reason why not. We got, I come from, uh, I think, a, a service with a really interesting history, the United States Air Force. We were um, challenged from the beginning with this problem. And the problem was we had too few airplanes and too many people wanting them. And that problem never got better. To this day, that problem never got better. We, uh, I, I was there, uh, I was the chief strategist for the Air Force when we had the, um, the surge uh, led by General Petraeus in Iraq. Uh, I remember trying to figure out which airplanes go where and that was not fun. Because we didn't have enough airplanes and everybody wanted them. So what we've basically had is an economics problem. We've had too little supply and too much demand. So how do you judge that? Well, there's not a free market when it comes to these types of things. Uh, so somebody has to be the decider. And believe me, we have gotten into knockout drag, you know, knockdown drag out fights between each other, trying to figure out who's the decider of where this air power goes. And that has been true for every uh, modern Air Force that, that is out there. All the Western Air Forces have had to figure this out. In fact, we've had to do some mental gymnastics that come with centralized control. We'll even say centralized control, decentralized execution, like we know what that means. And, uh, and, and we will, but, but basically it means it's mine, I'll decide. Because there's just not enough to go around. This is really important. It is possible with today's technology, there is enough to go around. It's possible. They're not that expensive. And they're getting cheaper all the time. They do things that are important for anybody to include the, the, the junior leader that's down on the front lines, whatever that front line looks like. They can have access to uncrewed systems. They can have them report to them. They could have them as part of their unit. They literally could train with them, the ones they're going to use. This is possible. And it's as disruptive as you think it might be, and even more. And this gets into the transformation. Our doctrine in every part of all the missions I've just talked about, firefighting, emergency management, military operations, and all that, none of our doctrine is ready for this disruption. None of it. How many of you are in organizations where you are actively building units at the lowest level with multiple uh, domains of uncrewed things? And the answer is none of you. Which could be. You could have access to all of these and make sure that your, whatever the element of action is in the thing that you're trying to do, that might be the on-scene commander, that might be the platoon or the company, it might be something else. But whatever that is, they could have as part of the, their integral unit elements of uncrewed things in multiple domains that could help them do their jobs. And we're not talking about numbers that are out of, of, of sight here. We're talking about numbers that are achievable with the economic conditions that we have today. But here's what I believe. None of you have the doctrine. <laughs> I don't have the doctrine, no, the, the police doesn't have the doctrine, Border Patrol doesn't have the doctrine, uh, the, uh, the, you know, any local emergency management, FEMA, none of them have the doctrine for this. Because what it means, the doctrine will mean that you will have to train your frontline leaders as multi-domain people 
leaders who are using uh, uncrewed systems in multiple domains to do their job. And you're not doing that right now. But you could. Think about what it might look like if we democratized access to information and we democratized access to air power, sea power, land power, robots that go on the, on the ground that can shoot or that can detect mines. So I would think about all the different things. We could, we could uh, have uh, on-scene commanders uh, fighting fires with their own drone swarm to figure out exactly who's where and what to include taking uh, care of their own people, knowing where their own people are. I suspect that's not an easy thing to do when you're fighting a fire. And then knowing where the fire is, because the fire is the threat, and making sure that you've got some level of understanding of the situation. And instead of having to rely on somebody you probably have not talked to, or you certainly haven't talked to them much, and you probably don't know very much about them, they don't know much about you, and, uh, and they just show up, and, they, and you hope you can have good communication with them. That's the way we have generally provided air power to uh, the frontline forces in the, uh, in the United States military. I suspect that's probably how we've provided air power in most situations. I bet you anything that the police officer in charge of a car chase scene who is talking to the helicopter has probably not talked to that helicopter pilot very much and probably never trained with them. But now we have the ability to integrate, to make integral these assets to small forces that are in the battle, in the engagement, at the front lines, doing the job. And I think it's going to be really hard to do this culturally, unfortunately. I think that we are very, uh, we're very comfortable with centralized control of these assets. I think we're very comfortable with, um, <coughs> with, uh, with you know, buying the asset and, and like having a very small amount of people know how to use it or how to operate it. And, uh, and we haven't been very comfortable with the true democratization of command and control of military and civil fusion and of multiple uncrewed systems in multiple domains. But we could. And it would change an awful lot, I think. I think it would make us better. I think it would make us faster. I think it would make us more effective. And I also believe that when we're talking about us versus the adversary, and certainly I believe this about Western militaries versus, versus Eastern militaries, our young people can do it, and I'm not sure theirs can because they've never had the opportunity to and they're not trusted. Our young leaders are trusted. We've put millions of dollars into them. We educate them, we train them, and we possibly could give them all of these things and trust them that they'll use it well. There is nobody in an Eastern military that's going to do that. And you know what? We're damn lucky that there's still more Eastern influence in China's military than Western influence, but that is changing. We heard Peter talk about that today. But there is a huge advantage that comes with having capable young people who you can trust, capable frontline leaders who you can trust. And if you had the doctrine to decentralize, you might be able to do some really interesting things in all of these different tasks. And it may make a huge difference in how we do it and how well we do it, how fast we do it. And it could change the way we operate, which is what doctrine is. I think you're going to see changes, in, and, and I don't mean small changes, I think you're going to see big changes in doctrine coming because of these systems and the trinity that I've identified. And that's a good thing. What we have to do now is to make sure of a couple of things. One, that we have the ability to produce enough of them. And that's not going to be easy. But we're going to need a lot because if you're going to give them out to every unit that's engaged, you're going to want to have a lot of them. Uh, you've got to make sure that the Command and control supports the young leaders, the NCOs, the officers, the police officers, the firefighters that are engaged. You can't funnel all the information back to the operations center and call it good and say you've done your job. 
And then third, I think you need to make sure that you give those frontline leaders the control mechanisms that they need to do the job. Right now, um, this is 100% true, uh, and I'll get off the stage with this. And this just shows you a little bit about where we are right now. So uh, this happened. Um, I have it on good authority. Uh, the, um, you know, we're training the Ukrainians right now in Poland. Uh, we being the United States and other Western countries. And there was a, um, there was a, uh, a, a Ukrainian NCO that asked the, uh, our army folks, do we have to use your system? And the system that they were referring to, they were learning how to do close air support. And the system that they were referring to was the system that allows the uh, Joint Tactical Air Controller to talk with the, the operations center and talk with the airplanes. And it's, you know, as you can imagine, it's hardened, it's, it's deployable, it's pretty big and all this kind of stuff. And, and the, the Ukrainian NCO asked the Army NCO, do we have to use your system? And, you know, the Army NCO, well, of course. I mean, this is the best, you know, that's what the United States uses. This is what you need to use. And, and the, uh, the Ukrainian NCO says, well, I've got all that on this iPad. And, and literally, they do. I, we, we know this. This is a system called Delta that they've put together, which takes in the information, puts it into the iPad, and uh, allows the control of different types of assets to include uh, fires and drones. Um, what do you think our NCO thought about that? Uh, he said, why don't I have an iPad? Uh, that's what I would have said. Now, that you could say all you want about, well, it's not encrypted. It's, uh, you know, it's a, easy to break cyber security. Okay, fine, fine. Uh, I think most of us understand that you probably could take care of those things. But think about it that when you're put under pressure, and if you, uh, I mean, just honestly, let's just say the Ukrainians are under real pressure right now. When you're put under pressure, you do things that you wouldn't otherwise do. And they have devolved command and control on their battle space down to the front. I think we should too. I think we should do that in every situation that we've been talking about across the different mission sets. And I think we ought to do it in peacetime so we don't have to figure it out in wartime. So we don't have to figure it out when the big uh, forest fire is going on. So we don't have to figure it out when we're fighting the gang in downtown. I think we ought to train to it. We ought to equip to it. We ought to, uh, we ought to revamp our organizations with it. And I think we ought to uh, make sure that those leaders on the front have what they need to be successful with this technology, using this technology, with enough of it that they can have control of it when they need it. And that's where it will require some decisions, some choices. I hope we're ready to make those choices. I'm not sure we are, but I hope we are. And my hope extends to the, uh, to the United States military, our Western allies, to the uh, different uh, forms of police, firefighters, um, emergency managers, uh, everybody that's coming after uh, uh, folks like uh, we're, we're looking for people. We just talked about the, uh, the young lady who was recovered in a swamp. I hope that in every case, we have trained and ready folks who are able to use this technology and do things faster and better. So let's try and do that. Let's try and make that true in the little choices that we make as we, uh, as we try to corral this technology, understand it, and make it work for us. And with that, I'm going to get off stage. But thank you. I appreciate it. Great. Here. So, uh, General Hyde, no, that's I right. Would, been... That's quite all right. But uh, thank you so much for that. Um, we do. We only have a couple minutes, so I want to. Um, uh, I know there's one question I want to um, uh, to get in from the virtual audience. It's time for like one quick question from from the room. If if we have any questions for for the general, we will go straight to the one uh, from virtual. And and it was something I was going to ask because you t uh, you know. You talked about the cultural challenges that are come, and then you painted a pretty rosy picture of like with the um, the younger personnel being ready to do this. So it begs the question of okay, where, where's the culture block, and and what do we do? And so the question is, how do we encourage the higher level leadership within DoD to see the usefulness of of SUAS for units to complete their mission and have them buy into its pursuit? 
Um, I have some I have some thoughts on how to change our military, and they're probably not standard thoughts because I've had to live it, and it's been not so easy, and it's taken a toll on me. Um, I don't know why people who don't see this are being promoted. Uh, honestly, uh, I, I don't know why people who aren't out there trying to figure out how this technology works for us are being promoted. But I will say is there are lots of people who will say, well, that's not the way I did it. And, uh, and I, I, I feel more comfortable with this. And I think what Peter said is true, the comfort level and all of that. And the bigger the organization, the easier it is to revert to the mean, the comfort level. And that's wrong. And uh, if you were talking about disruptive change, and this is disruptive, incremental change, we got. I mean, using that thing a little bit better I, I, our, our officers, our NCOs, our airmen, our soldiers, they're going to be fine with that. It's the disruptive part, which is building units with it as integral parts. That's the stuff that, uh, that the NCO out there on the field can't, can't do anything about. And this is what um, disruptive leaders at all levels have to do. I believe that if you're not thinking about disruptive change in our military today, you're not reading the tea leaves because the environment is there. We're getting ready to lose. And dadgummit, if that's not enough reason to change, I don't know what is. And so I, I, I kind of put the ball in the, in the leader's court, mm -hmm. and both civilian and military, and say, look, you don't get a chance to like say, well, you know, that's not the way I did it. I'm really not very comfortable with that technology. Don't know a lot about this generative AI stuff, and uh, just don't know uh, kind of what that's going to mean for us. I am so sick of hearing that answer from military leaders. My gosh, Who's el who else is going to figure this out? I'm sorry. Uh, as you can probably tell, I've had a little scar tissue on this. <laughs> um, but but I, I do. I think uh, we have to expect from our leaders that they are analyzing the environment that we're in. They're doing their best to understand the emerging technology, even the disruptive technology, and that they are figuring out, or at least experimenting with different ways of using it. Now, some of the leaders are doing a good job, and thank goodness for that. And some of them are standing in the way, and they need to leave. Uh, that's my opinion. Well, I think that's a good I place to leave. I can say that now that I'm uh, retired, by the <laughs> yes. way. But, it's uh, easy to do. Lieutenant General Hino, thank you so much You're for a great conversation. Great to see you. I really appreciate it.